Early last year, when the threat of COVID was just starting to emerge, there was a small set of voices that demonstrated vision and judgment about the course of the pandemic that I began to really rely on them. One of them, somewhat surprisingly, was a former member of the Trump administration, who before the U.S. recorded its very first COVID death, co-wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal, an opinion piece warning that we must act now to prevent an American epidemic. Dr. Scott Gottlieb served for nearly two years as Trump's Food and Drug Administration Commissioner. He left in 2019, and he's been one of those rare conservatives who's remained sensible, clear-eyed, and data-driven about the pandemic. Now he's a new book out titled Uncontrolled Spread, Why COVID-19 Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic, where he provides new details about what went wrong, particularly at the agency level, and made the country so vulnerable to this novel coronavirus. And Scott Gottlieb, former FDA commissioner, current Pfizer board member, joins me now. It's good to have you, doctor. Um, I've, I've sort of followed your, your work and, and have uh, benefited from it. So thanks for coming on the program. I, I want to ask what your, what your first moment, what was your first uh-oh stomach drop moment in 2019 or 2020 about this? Yeah, I remember it vividly. It was Martin Luther King Day weekend, and the reporting overnight had gone from 50 cases that were being reported in Wuhan of severe pneumonia to 200. And all the cases that were being reported were people who were hospitalized with very severe conditions. And so whenever you see that, you worry that it's just the, just the tip of the iceberg, that if... 200 people are hospitalized with very severe pneumonia. There must be hundreds, if not thousands, of people with milder symptoms who are going unreported, because it's unusual to see a respiratory pathogen that just causes severe pneumonia. So I made a phone call that day to Joe Grogan, the head of the Domestic Policy Council in the White House, to express my concerns. I talk about this in the book, and urge him to reach out to the Department of Health and Human Services to get a coordinated briefing together between FDA and CDC, because I knew it was going to be important that the different agencies in HHS start to coordinate a response. He actually followed up on that. He uh, asked for that briefing that day, and that actually is what triggered a phone call between the secretary that day and the president. It was the first time that the secretary briefed the president. He called him while he was on the golf course to brief him for the first time on the, uh, on the unfolding situation in Wuhan. I believe that the phone call that Grogan had made to the department is what triggered that, uh, that subsequent phone call. You write in the book about that, that, that key period, late February, and, the, and to me, the key day is Nancy Massonier's briefing, where she says, I'll never forget it, <laughs> coming in here. I've talked to my principal about remote school, and I'm thinking, you talked to the principal about remote school. This is you know, late February. You write about the, the fallout. Trump was upset with the CDC briefing in February, warning that community spread was all but inevitable. The federal health officials stopped announcing new COVID mitigation measures for a full two weeks. If the mere hint of mitigation prompted markets to swoon, some of the White House political team argued, it could be utter carnage if they actually implemented the measures Masonia had discussed. It prompted the White House to freeze further action for full two weeks while they considered their options. How costly was that? Yeah, people in the administration refer to it as the lost two weeks. I was talking to people over the time period. Um, that's the president put the vice president in charge of the response at that point. But they, they did a sort of reassessment of where they were. And it wasn't until another two weeks that they started to take more aggressive actions. It was very costly. This was at the point when the epidemic really was exploding inside the U.S. We just didn't know it. The other component of that Messenier briefing, she said that community spread was all but inevitable. But yep. in that same briefing, which got less attention, she said there was no community spread at this time, which we now know wasn't true. There, in fact, was a lot of community spread of the virus already underway. Part of that uh, was the fact that the testing was broken from the beginning. And this is a real institutional failure. You know, I mean, there's layers to the failure that happened here. But but CDC really botched the testing. I mean, they basically said, we're going to issue our own tests. And then those tests didn't uh, work. What, how do you understand that failure, why it happened? Yeah, it wasn't just the failure of the CDC to be able to design, to deploy their own test. The idea was that they were going to design a test. They had access to the virus samples, so they would design a test. They would manufacture it at a small scale and deploy it to the public health labs. There's 100 public health labs in this country, each capable of doing about 100 tests a day. So that's 10,000 tests a day. That's nowhere near what we needed. What needed to happen was we needed to get the commercial manufacturers engaged right from the outset. Right. Someone in early January inside the administration needed to say that we needed more testing and needed to get the large-scale manufacturers in the game. CDC was not going to be able to fill the testing void. This is a question that doesn't directly bear on your considerable expertise in a variety of areas, but I'm going to ask it. We're approaching 700,000 Americans that we've lost to this thing. We're losing 2,000 2, human lives a day. 
Are you surprised that it hasn't done more <laughs> to shake up our politics, that it hasn't done more uh, to, to overcome some of the vaccine resistance and hesitancy we've seen and some of the rhetoric we've seen about masking and mitigation measures? I think we've become somewhat anesthetized to the death and disease, quite frankly, um, because it's grown slowly over time. If, you know, we had 2,000 deaths a day a year ago, it would have been um, a far greater tragedy in the minds of many people than it is right now, because we've become more complacent to the risks. So that is deeply unfortunate. I will say, from, a, from the standpoint of the achievement of getting people vaccinated, now fully 77 percent of all adults over the age of 18 have had at least one dose of vaccine. Most of them will complete the series. That's a remarkable achievement. I think the Biden administration has done an outstanding job rolling out this vaccine. Um, we've gotten a lot of adults vaccinated. We still need to do more. Um, I think we need to get to 80, 85 percent. But 77 percent is a remarkable achievement over this time period. Can you imagine a, a, a threshold in which we're not having a brutal winter? Yeah, I can. I think on the back end of this Delta wave, we're going to have so much immunity in the population, yeah. either from vaccination or from people who acquire immunity, that we're unlikely to see a very dense wave of infection this fall, late fall and winter, unless something unusual happens. We get a new variant that pierces the immunity offered by vaccination. I think on the back end of this Delta wave, this may be our last major surge of coronavirus before we settle into a more seasonal endemic pattern with this virus. From your lips to God's ears. Um Pfizer uh, is one of the manufacturers of the vaccine, obviously, and, and one of the things that one of the fears right now is that the longer this uh, transmit around the world, the longer we're, we're, the, the likelihood of new variants, uh, as well as the sort of humanitarian tragedy. Um, Pfizer has, has opposed um, coming out in various ways of waiving intellectual property regulations to make the vaccine uh, manufacturable in other countries. Um, why shouldn't it be the case at this point Pfizer, Moderna, other drug companies who made billions of dollars and have produced a very good product, to be clear, that that is essentially open sourced so that the world can produce it at the lowest possible marginal cost to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Yeah, look, the patents around the mRNA technology are owned by many different companies uh, and are cross-licensed. A lot of them are actually owned by Japanese, uh, Japanese firms. Um, the key is trying to make supply available. Pfizer's made a billion doses available to low-income income countries, has moved facilities into South Africa, has partnered with a facility in South Africa to do fill finishing in that continent. I think that's really going to be the solution, trying to get manufacturing stood up in other parts of the world and get supply into other parts of the world. Right now, if you look at the supply over the next 12 months, we may have between 10 and 15 billion doses of vaccine available between, over the next 12 months. The real issue is going to become distribution, getting the resources on the ground to deliver vaccine in very austere settings. I think that's where the WHO and other entities need to start to focus their attention because the supply is going to be there. Are we better prepared now for a future pandemic? Obviously, SARS happened in the early part of the, the century. Um, we're, we're now dealing with COVID. It seems to me all but certain. I, I think a lot of people think this now that I will see another one of these in my lifetime. Are we better prepared now? Only insofar as we recognize our vulnerabilities, we haven't started to address them. We have systemic weaknesses in the structure of our response in this country that made us excessively vulnerable to this pandemic. We haven't fixed those. We don't have an operational agency capable of mounting a national level response. We don't have an agency capable of collecting and analyzing information and offering guidance in a real time fashion to inform real time policymaking. We relied on the CDC to do that. The CDC does many things very well. But they can't respond to a fast-moving crisis, and I think we wrongly assume that they had yeah. that capability. They don't. We're going to need to build it into that agency. We can't build a new agency. We're going to need to reform and build out the CDC to handle this crisis. I think that's very astute uh, and on the money. Scott Gottlieb, whose new book, Uncontrolled Spread, is out now. Thanks for making time tonight.